Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back after lunch. Thank you for being here. I'm going to jump right in because this is a really packed panel of stuff to talk about. Um, thank you, Howard and Allison, for doing this. No so we're going to go through step by step how they make comics. Um, this is going to be real technical and nerdy. So if you're not a cartoonist, get your pillows out. <laughs> Um, and we're going to first talk about serial comics, Dykes to Watch Out For, and Wendell. And then we're going to talk about book-length comics, which and Stuck Rubber Baby, and Fun Home. So this is a slide of Alison Bechtel standing in front of a drawn slide of her first Dykes to Watch Out For. And that was in a letter? Yes, this is a, a letter I wrote to a, a friend. And this was 1982. Yes. And how did that evolve into the <laughs> comic strip? <laughs> you know, I, sorry, I have to figure out this mic. I don't need to be very close to it, I guess. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, I graduated from college, and I was writing letters to a friend who was still in college. And she was this very kind of funny, wacky woman and inspired a certain kind of humor in me. And she just thinking of writing to her, I would make silly pictures for her, and that just came out one day, this crazy lesbian, and I, for some reason, called it Dykes to Watch Out for plate number 26, as if I had 25 other ones, which I didn't. Um, but I liked the idea of a whole bunch of pictures, so I just kept doing them, and then eventually it turned into that. And the, and the first strips were standalone comics, and then you developed these characters, and this is the first strip where Mo and Lo appear, and how did those, was that organic, or did you think of that? Well, I was very intimidated by the prospect of writing about regular characters. I, I had seen Wendell by this point, and was so impressed with it, and didn't know how, first of all, how he drew the characters to look the same from episode to episode. <laughs> that was a very daunting prospect to me. Um, but I, I kind of ran out of steam just doing single panel cartoons. We were just talking with, with Gerard Donnellan about the difference between writing single panel cartoons and stories. And I f at first I felt like I couldn't write a story. I could just do a single panel strip. But the single panel cartoons are quite, quite difficult to keep coming up with interesting ideas. And eventually I found it was easier actually to tell stories than single panels. So that's why I started doing this. And um, this is a strip you did of talking about what you did at the beginning, that you just wanted to basically celebrate lesbians. Um, and how did that change? Like, when you were first doing the strip, what did you want to say? And later, when you were doing the strip, what did you want to say? Well, at the be beginning, I just wanted to see people like me and my friends in the visible world, because I, I didn't see representations of us anywhere. So I just did it for that. I felt like I wanted to somehow prove that lesbians are just regular people, lesbians are humans. And I guess by the, after 25 years of doing that comic strip, I felt like, okay, let's, let, we all know lesbians are people, so <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, and you had storylines and you had politics. So how did you balance, like, did you feel like you always had to have some social commentary? And did sometimes, you know, how did you balance those two things, melodrama and social commentary? The, the political and social stuff came in more later. At the beginning, it wasn't, it was there, but not so much. Um, but I felt, you know, I was surrounded by all these activist lesbians. That's what my, who my friends were and what they did. And I wanted to reflect their concerns. Like, they were all out, you know, they were going to Nicaragua and uh, helping with the, coffee harvest and protesting on Wall Street and stuff. So those became the kind of concerns of my, my strip, too. Uh, and in a lot of ways, um, I mean, the, the melodrama and personal is political, like this strip where it's, you know, two lesbians having a baby, which is kind of, is that melodrama or is that politics? So they kind of all merge, right? Yeah. Um, and so you had a two-week schedule. Yes. So you couldn't work that far ahead to be topical. How did you hand juggle that? I was always working up until the last minute. I had this fantasy that somehow I would get ahead of myself. But it was actually, it's better that way if you're writing about topical stuff because there was, um, you know, there's still this lag time between when you start inking and mailing the thing out and 
the newspaper was finally publishing. It was always late, no matter how uh, up to the minute I was, the, there was always a lag time. Um, what was the question? Sorry. Just that you were always on deadline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and this is a great strip about Iraq. And, and so yeah, it's one of those things that you had to really be up to the minute or it would be out of date. Yeah. Um, the internet changed all that because you could be much more instantaneous. But in the old days, you had to like carve stuff in a rock and put it in the Pony Express. <laughs> and how did you keep track of your... I know you had a Bible. I actually had a, a gigantic spreadsheet, like soap opera people keep, with um, the episode numbers down here and the character names across the top. And then in the, all the cells, I would keep track of their stories and project where I wanted their stories to go. And this is a timeline you did from one of your books. Where Did you do this after? Yeah, this is after the fact. <laughs> and you even drew a map of where everybody lived. Yeah. And when you drew this map, did you, like, had you, this was just the picture in your brain that you had all along? Well, kind of, because it, it's actually a, a map of South Minneapolis <laughs> that I disguised. And that's where I was living when I started writing about these characters. So I imagined them living in my own neighborhood. Um, how did you do research? <laughs> <laughs> My life was research, you know? This was, I would go to the women's bookstore, and this is, uh, everything I did was like a tax write-off, you know? Because um, <laughs> I was just always observing. But I know that, like, when you had specific storylines, you reached out to people, like, oh, people yeah. who were having babies or inseminating or... Oh, yeah. I meant to send you a picture of my files, but I, I don't have them anymore. But I, I had, like, huge hard copy files on all kinds of topics, disability, lesbian parenting, anti-racism, like stuff that I would just, now you don't need to do that because you can just find it in a second when you need it. But So I these were news articles? News, or? Yeah, because I would get all these gay papers that the strip ran in uh, all around the country. I would clip articles and had a big, big clipping file. Um... So your characters, when you were writing characters and adding new characters to the story, was it organic, like they just kind of popped in? Or did you say, oh, I need a specific type? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, God, it's hard to remember. <laughs> no, it was really so long ago. But the important thing is that all of these characters, even though they're all like really different people, they're all just aspects of my own personality. That was how I managed to write about them at all, because they're just they're all me. So when you were writing about people who weren't you, different races, different genders, whatever, you just kind of made them into yourself? Yeah. I mean, I would try to inc you know, I would include specific things about whoever they were, but also the way I connected with them was, you know, they were me. Like, Clarice is my workaholic self, and Ginger is my intimacy-phobic self. So <laughs> I always had this intimate connection to each of them. Truthfully, do you have favorites? No, no, I love them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> Were some more fun to draw than others? Uh, well, they all had their challenges. Like some people's hairstyles were very time consuming. Uh, uh, I like drawing them all. I, I assume if you didn't like them, you'd probably kill them off. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to go to Wendell. So I just want to mention that Dykes to Watch Out For started in 1983 and Wendell started in 1983, which somehow I had forgotten that they both started in the same year, but maybe... Well, but mine wasn't really a strip at that point. Right, just you were just... single panels. Yeah. So. so this is the By first... By the way, I have something to say. Oh, to go ahead. Ms. Bechdel. Uh, <laughs> the, if you think I was drawing my characters alike all the time, just put them on a light table <laughs> on top of each other... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, once you uh, sort of figure out, and I'm sure you have discovered over the years, once people get them in their heads, yeah. uh, all you need is a few cues, a certain way of doing hair, or a certain, and they change on their own as you keep drawing them over and over. I mean, that was my first drawing, my first sketch mm -hmm. of Wendell. Um, and, of course, he changed a good bit uh, from that. And did you go to the, it, Wendell ran in the Advocate, and did you go to the Advocate? Did they come to you? How did that happen? Yeah, I got in, they were in touch with me. They, they had forgotten that I had done some gag cartoons for them in the past. Um, 
but I did this strip uh, for the Village Voice uh, about uh, the anti-gay uh, backlash called Sometimes I Get So Mad. And um, anyway, they liked it, and they asked if they could reprint it in The Advocate. So there I was in touch with them, and I'd been looking at um, the Advocate at the time was not the size it is now. It used to be a big tabloid. Pages were large. And I would look at those big pages and say, boy, I would like to have a comic strip filled those big pages, sort of the way Prince Valiant used to get a whole yeah. newspaper page. And uh, so anyway, I actually proposed, uh, right after I did, we did Gay Comics number three, which included the story Dirty Old Lovers, uh, I, uh, about Luke and Clark, this older, wild couple, um, I proposed to them that I do a comic strip, uh, a Dirty Old Lovers comic strip regularly for The Advocate. And they liked the idea of a comic strip, but they said, you know, could you do it about somebody young? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the first Wendell strip. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's pink. And can you tell us why it's pink? Yeah, it was on the pink pages. It used to be The Advocate had two sections. They had the regular magazine on, you know, white or whitish newsprint. And uh, they had a second section called the pink pages, which is where all of the sex, sexually explicit ads and classified ads were. And those, that section was not folded into the paper on newsstands because it was really, it would be challenging uh, to, to not get arrested. Um, but if you subscribed, you got the pink pages too. And since it was all about sex, you know, my first idea was that Wendell would be a satire, you know, having fun with the gay singles scene. And so the early days uh, uh, on the back page uh, of the pink pages, uh, as time went on, I, you know, I both got slightly bored with, you know, that one note thing and, and began to do some strips that were more about the gay scene, gay politics. Uh, um, and, um, you know, that felt more natural because that reflected my life more. And um, so anyway, it, uh, eventually uh, it became clear that it was not a sex strip, first and foremost. And, uh, and it became uh, popular with readers. And uh, they decided it was an asset to the magazine. And, and you also had, I'm sorry, the, you also had the two-week schedule. I also had a two-week schedule. Um, you know, I grew up thinking I wanted to do like a daily strip or, uh, uh, you know, or, something really luxurious like a weekly strip the way uh, uh, Burke Brethid uh, did for a while with uh, Opus and Outland and stuff. But um, but I shudder at the thought of trying to maintain that kind of schedule. I, I just would have totally gone crazy. So were you always, you also had politics. I'm showing some of your political stuff here. Um, you Were you always up against the deadline because you wanted to be topical or because you were I just tried to <laughs> reflect what was going on in the gay community at the time. Um, and uh, only occasionally was I very specifically tightly topical. Um, there was one where the March on Washington, the 1987 March on Washington, was going to happen, and I wanted my characters to go to the March on Washington, so I timed everything so that I could have uh, not only, you know, have them at the, at the march itself, uh, and also... Um, there was a demonstration against the uh, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court building, because that was the year, it was the year after, actually, the Hardwick uh, decision came down, which said that, yes, states could uh, make uh, gay sex illegal. And it was uh, it took 17 years for that to be overturned, but it was an outrage, uh, sort of like, you know, DOMA. I mean, one of these Supreme Court things that, that surely they could not say that was constitutional. Um, but anyway, so there was a demonstration against that, that uh, Eddie, my husband, um, was going to be in, but I couldn't be in it because I had to leave the march and get back to New York and finish my strip about being in that demonstration <laughs> uh, <laughs> and get it to the advocate in time for it to appear while the uh, that was recent news. And um, were you originally Wendell was kind of light lighthearted and then... AIDS came along. There had to be a shift, uh, relatively subtle, but a shift in tone uh, when I realized I could not escape uh, including AIDS. 
as part of this. And I want to talk about this strip as the one with Sawyer, where you, you actually brought in a character who was dying from AIDS. And yeah, how, although he didn't, he didn't die. Another character died. He did not oh, die. Right, he recovered. Right. He, he appeared later, and, um, uh, which I, was very important to me because I disliked this tendency to bring in gay people so they can die. <laughs> and uh, you could feel sympathy for them, you know, but they're gone. And uh, so, can we talk about Gary Trudeau for a second? Because you've like publicly criticized him for doing that. Yeah, he's kind of redeemed himself. I think he, uh, you know, by but at the time, there was only one gay character uh, in Doonesbury. It was very courageous that he yeah. did that. That was a groundbreaking thing. But then a few years later, he, his name was Andy Lippincott, and a few years later, he got AIDS, and then we watched him decline and die. And I. Um, you know, I felt given that that was the only gay character in the strip at the time, I thought it was, I mean, it was not, it was not only somewhat offensive and stereotypical, and I think this was totally unintended. I think Trudeau's political instincts are good, but I think he misfired uh, on this. And, uh, uh, but also, I thought that's not where the real story is. The real story was the AIDS activism and the uh, incredible organization and the fighting uh, of AIDS and ACT UP and all of that, if, you know, if, if Trudeau had been really attuned to the gay community, that would be where the exciting stuff to put in Doonesbury would have been. And, uh, you know, I faulted him for that in, an, in a piece I wrote for, um, what was the name of that magazine, Outlook? Yeah, or uh, Out Week, yeah. or Out, out something. Out, no, what Out Week? Oh, the, the, the Out magazine. Out, one of the Out magazines, yeah. How uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you about your characters. Um, you in, included the dirty old lovers into this yeah, strip. Yeah, yeah, I, I fooled them. I um, they, uh, after I'd done Wendell for a while, I incorporated the dirty old lovers into Wendell as uh, Wendell's uncle and his lover, and so that way I got to use those characters and get them into the advocate after all. Um, and they were just loads of fun to write. They were They're just such a... Uh, enjoyable. They just write their own stuff. They're just, uh, just very outrageous. And I wanted to ask you about your female characters because I always was impressed, even in Barefoot, your female characters are very uh, powerfully sexual often, and I love Tina. And um, But you're very... Um, how do you write characters that aren't you? Well, I mean, I really think this is about paying attention to the people around you. Um, and it, at that time in particular, you know, there was a lot of consciousness raising on my part that happened between 1972 when I started doing underground comics and, um, you know, by the time I was doing Wendell. And, you know, I look back at some of the early stuff I did and wince a little bit uh, at, you know, there was a character named Dolly in Barefoots who, yes, she was powerfully sexual, but she was also set up for a lot of humiliation because Barefoots was not interested in being sexual. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time I was... Uh, you know, incorporating, you know, lesbians into, into um, Wendell, you know, I had many more lesbian friends to draw on. And uh, there was even a character I based on you, by the way, uh, Miss uh, Camper. Uh, and, um, but, uh, Which one? Uh, and it, was a, it, was, it was a sad character, but I had to draw. Now this. I gotta go back and look at them all. <laughs> I always thought Tina was you. I don't know. I'm going to go back and read every single one. Um, and do you have favorite characters? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm like Allison. Uh, they each have, they each are fun to draw. And usually, if there's one that's not fun yet, I will detect that this character is a little bland, and I would find, you know, some way to incorporate a different aspect in their personality. So you make them fun. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes I would respond to uh, readers. Like I did a, um, after that first Wendell book came out, I did a book signing in L.A. And, uh, you know, one young man came up to me, uh, you know, about, could, could have been my son. Uh, and, uh, you know, first he complimented me, love Wendell, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, why are all your young men airheads? And I did not, had not thought of it in that way. Uh, the main, basically the only really d decidedly young character in the strip was first introduced playing video games. He was all into I video games. I remember that, games. yeah. And, uh, and then I did another one where, you know, he wasn't displaying much 
intellect or anything. That was, you know, he was just a, an airhead young kid, and I, I didn't mean to do that, but I had done it unintentionally. And uh, it was after that that I made a point of um, pulling him in in ways where he would be part of the activist scene, and um, um, you know, so I I tried to give him more dimensions. And generally, you know, someone like Tina gained an interest. At first, she was kind of I brought her in as you know what happens when a friend's a friend of yours gets a lesbian that's like really obnoxious, <laughs> and because uh, I think some of us have experience that with our friends sometimes. <laughs> and uh, But the trouble is that she was obnoxious in interesting ways, and then I got all into Tina. And uh, she became even more political than uh, Sterno, who previously was the, the more political uh, of the characters. And uh, I came to like Tina a lot, and I think readers detect if you like the character. I think they know if you're... I'm going to move because we have a lot to cover here. Okay. Um, pencils. Allison, um, what kind of pencil do you use when you were drawing Dykes to Watch Out For? What kind of pencils? Yeah. Uh, just a mechanical pencil, like with a 0 .05, 0 .5 lead. Just and what kind of paper did you do your pencils on? Just whatever. Was oh, it? this is, well, the final pencil is on um, Bristol board. Just, um, you know, plate finish Bristol. And, but when you were doing sketches, it would just be on whatever kind of paper? Whatever, or often tracing paper, because I'd be, you know, doing different and, layers. And what kind of eraser do you use? Back then. <laughs> this is the stuff I want to know. I love this shit. I have this great <laughs> eraser that they don't make anymore. It was a, it's a puroplast. Oh, I remember erases. those. It would take the pencil away without taking the shine off of your ink. Because at this time you were ink, at this point you were inking right on your pencils. Yes. Without the light box. Yeah. Well, no, with the light box. I mean, on the same piece of paper? I mean, I would do my pencil underneath on the Bristol board on the light box, looking at my sketch underneath, and then I would ink on that. On the Bristol with the pencil that was still there. And then there. erase the pencil. Yeah, and then erase the pencil. Isn't that what everybody does? <laughs> no, but that, now you have a clean Bristol over your pencils, and you don't have to erase. No, I don't. You still I just erase. use non-repro blue pencil, so I don't have to erase. Cool. Do you realize use it? that? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter because now the scanners <laughs> reproduce the fucking non repro In the digital, it used to be that was, you know, the blue pencils were the thing, but uh, it's totally irrelevant in the world of digital yeah. stuff. Because all you have to is increase the contrast and the blue will go away. Yeah, figured that out. Did you place. use an Ames guide <laughs> or did you have your oh, own? I, I started using an Ames guide when I began writing about regular characters and the same the oh, things really? happened. Oh, really? That's like moment. the turning point. That's so cool. Yes. Uh, in 1987, I discovered the Ames Lettering Guide, and everything was different forever after. I'm not going to explain what an Ames Guide is, because these are all cartoonists. Here's lettering. This is all hand lettering. Um, you wanna, what, what are your thoughts about lettering? Well, I, I mean, partly why I'm a cartoonist is I love, I love the words as much as the pictures. You know, I, 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 I love the act of hand lettering. I feel really kind of sheepish, because as I've gone on to do these more book-length pieces, I'm using a digital font and totally skipping the stage. And I don't like the way it looks. It's, uh, I feel like... I wanted to just bring up every episode of Dykes for, to Watch Out For had a little title, and you would do a different typeface. And I used to recognize, I used to like, oh, that's, you know, such and such. That's Will Robinson. That's this and that. I mean, I could recognize the typefaces you were doing, and I loved that, being a type geek. Yeah, I mean, this was before you could just get any font on your computer that you wanted in a second. I would collect type books from Fontographer and stuff and mm -hmm. just look through those all the time. And then here's your lettering that's oh, typeset. But I want to just point out... If you look in the word three, the two E's are different. In the word school, the two O's are different. In the word miss, the two S's are different. And that makes a big difference, people, if you're going to typeset your comics. Make your type beautiful. And I think you did a really good job in mimicking your hand lettering and having non-repeats. How did you do that? Well, it, there's just two sets of each letter. So I've learned how to type. If I'm typing like school and I put two O's, I, I hit the shift key for the second O. So it's a capital and a yeah. small. Well done. Give away that little well done. Was that in, <laughs> Was that in Fontographer? Um, yes. I didn't, I didn't do that, but the guy who made the font did. And did you have your hand lettering and then they scanned it in or something? Yeah. And then did you tweak it or... No, 
you I mean, it got it. all, you know, vectorized when they did that, so it looks so, that's why it looks so neat. Um, let's talk about the graphic design of a page. What do you think about when you're designing the page? I don't think about design. Howard is the master of design. All I can do is like get the panels down, let alone do anything interesting with them. And when you were doing this strip, different publications would print it in different, some people would do one full yeah, page. Yeah, actually, uh, okay, to be fair to myself, I had a funny limitation in that I didn't have two big tabloid pages to fill. I had the bottom of a tabloid newspaper the bottom section that ran across one side, and I had to make that same comic strip work in a paperback book. So in the, in the comics page where it ran horizontally, the panels would go do, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, like that. But I had to be able to rearrange them so that, <laughs> this is so ridiculous, so that the first tier in the newspaper became the left-hand page in the book. So it was, it was quite restricted. I couldn't burst out of those, um, there's four integral units mm -hmm. that I couldn't um, go outside of. But that's in the grand tradition of cartooning. Uh, when I was a kid and began to pay attention to what was going on technically, uh, in the newspaper findings, every newspaper, uh, every Sunday strip, had to be able to be put in three different configurations. It had to, you had a, uh, uh, a full tabloid page, like the New York Daily News is the way they ran that, and uh, then you had a half page in three tiers, and then you had a two tier, and you had to have, um, and in one of the, oh, for the, for the tabloid configuration, it wouldn't work unless there was one panel that could be eliminated. Oh, right, yes, I remember so you that. always had to have one panel that was not necessary that yeah. you could cut out. And speaking of panels, Let's talk about how you, so that was how you designed the page. How would you design your panels? Like in this sequence, you've got panels with incredible background. I just noticed a horrible mistake. Look, I left the, in the bottom left panel, I didn't get rid of that line. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you just ruined everything. Oh. I'm sorry, what were you asking? So, <laughs> So, so when you designed, a, when, so when you were thinking of panel design, you, you know, sometimes you have a lot of backgrounds. Sometimes you have like this big one. You're cramming in so many people, so much information, yeah. and yet you have time for this like quiet panel. It, I, it was always hard to make room for those I, I, silent panels with no words were, were so great for the timing, but I, I rarely could make room. But it's always worth it when I did. But yeah, it, it was mostly just a design problem. How do I get all this text, all these characters, all these like visual cues onto this page as efficiently as possible? And what's, well, it's not like really fun. It's not like art. It's more like design. Design is art. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. So now we're talking about Howard's pencils. Um, Howard, you had this layout. Is that how you would do every strip? That was basically my first try at a, a, at a layout for... I think that was when Wendell had gone to a two-page regular magazine size, a two-page spread. And so I would just do a, basically, a, you know, a starting point was nine panels a page, uh, except the top. That would usually be the Wendell panel that had the logo, so that was usually joined. And so I would just sort of scribble in what, how I thought it might start and how I thought it might end. And and then what would come in between, how one would move toward the other. And usually, like, this is my first draft. And uh, as you can see, I became more and more aware that I was crowding too much stuff. I needed too much to happen at the beginning. And so the combination of trimming stuff and simply redistributing it um, through the panels. This is, a, you know, the pencil. I, I think I have, this has a companion slide. I went through four stages of drawing, although that's the first stage. This is the roughest, the roughest part of a sketch. And then I would trace that in ink onto tracing paper. Uh, to, and I would start getting the picture. But then I, would, then I would trace that onto the Bristol board, which gave me another opportunity to do minor is changes. Is pencil at this stage? Uh, this is the pencil on the 
uh, in this case, I knew I was going to use this as a demo, and so I uh, uh, copied it before I inked it because the, all those pencil lines would go away ultimately. And uh, if you you notice that um, there are minor uh, minor things, like for example, if you go back to that previous slide, uh, no, yeah, I had trouble deciding what Wendell's hand position would be, and I had it sort of spread out at first. And then by doing all these different redrawings of it, uh, I could sort of see, well, that's a problem. And so I said, okay, well, if you lie down exactly how you'd like me to hold your hand, and I would realize, oh, we're, we're much more likely to have your hand in this position than in this position. And there's a lot of little opportunities um, to make changes. And this is the uh, going through different stages of working out the content of the word balloons. Um, and then I would ultimately arrive at this. At that time, this was all before digital. And I had a, actually what I did in my case, rather than the Ames guide, I um, made a guide of the, you know, the, the normal size letters, just in um, a series of straight lines across a page, and copied that onto um, acetate. And then I would put that under the Bristol board well, so you had that, your own template. And that allowed me to do the uh, lettering without having to do more yeah. of those pencil lines That's on brilliant. the paper. You know, Now I just, I, I worked out the digital font that most approximates the spacing and size of my letters, and I just type it out in Illustrator and put that on the yeah. uh, board and trace that. Yeah. But I do, like to, I do like to end up with hand lettering. I did what you did for a while, uh, actually a fan, uh, wrote and said, "Hey, I'm going to do. I want to do a fan. Uh, I mean, do it. Do a font of your hand of your hand lettering." And I said, "Oh, okay." Uh, and then he did, and he asked me to do some sample letters. He didn't go as far as yours, which I realize really is important to have variations of the same letter. Otherwise, it reads as an, an art, a font. And I, speaking of, you know, this whole the way your balloons become part of the graphic is just beautiful. And I think a lot of it is the white space you use. I mean, also how you design your word balloons is, is just delicious. Well, um, I, and you I do the, the thick and thin, or the bold and regular face in your lettering. Yeah. That's, I've often thought I really should get rid of that. That's so comic booky. y uh, I'm a little embarrassed by it because, you know, oh, the bold face. It's so much more legible, though. It's so, so beautiful. The bold face is not. It, it implies, well, usually, this is the most important thing in this block of words. But really, this is about inflection. Yeah, yeah it's emphasis. Um, and, you know, if you say, well, that's not what I meant, you know, so that would be um, emphasized. But um, I became aware that a lot of, I mean, that's the way comics were often in when I was a kid, and I got used to that. And I've often thought, you know, that seems, you know, there's nothing like that in written text literature. Matter of fact, one time someone interviewed me, and and they, you know, included some dialogue, from, and they made everything where I had put black, you put the and they did that in all caps. Yeah. And it looked ridiculous. Um, so I've often thought of eliminating it, the way I ultimately eliminated ending every sentence with an exclamation point, <laughs> which is another. I love that. You, you go through Wendell, and you don't realize every sentence either ends exclamation, a question mark, or an ellipsis. That's an old comic book tradition. But when I was doing Sucker or Baby, I said, you know, this is really inappropriate. This is people talking calmly. This is not people talking in exclamation. So I let's, abandoned that. Let's talk about page layout, because you're just, you have such beautiful page designs. Um, well, this was a special page. This was Wendell and Ollie imagining getting married. And this was long before gay marriage was, anybody thought it would ever be possible. So this was really about what the commitment vows would be for a gay couple, which is not your standard, you know, uh, it, it, it's a lot more nuanced. Gay, gay couples were always able to make up their own relationship. There wasn't a template that they all followed. Some are open relationships, some are not open relationships. Uh, some people are open relationships, but don't tell me what you did. The others, you know, Eddie and I always came home with full reports. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, so anyway, I, I always thought this was one of the creative beauties of the gay community, that we didn't have this Blondie and Dagwood template. And uh, so anyway, that was, uh, uh, I, I was celebrating, that was a celebratory panel, and that's why it was such a poster. Here's another example. You do a lot of shapes 
panels that are in shapes, and I think, I don't know, you can talk about why you do that or how well, This was a memory thing. This was, Wendell was visiting this guy who was his first boyfriend when they were both teenagers and lived next door. And he had not seen him in years, and he came back and discovered that he had AIDS and visited him in the hospital. And they wound up having a conversation, a sort of a why did you break up with me conversation. And uh, the, the flashbacks I did in odd-shaped panels to indicate this is something different from just another panel in the contemporary story. Here's another beautiful layout. And when you have a panel like that with no border, is that visualized in your head when you're writing it? Does that just come up in the penciling stage? Or do you go, oh, I don't think I'll ink that border? It's just about having variety. Uh, and some panels just naturally feel like they should be expansive in that way. But also sometimes it's just, OK, I've had box, 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 box. I need a non-box. <laughs> so here we are with inking. Um, this is an early Allison cartoon. And I want you to look at your cross-hatching, Allison, because I have this really vivid memory of Howard and Allison being in my village apart basement apartment. And you were both sitting on the floor on my coffee table. And you okay. said, Howard, show me how you do cross-hatching. And Howard carefully showed you how he did his cross-hatching. And I just was watching that. And of course, I, you know, we didn't have cameras to videotape it. But what kind of pen were you using here? This was a, looks like a rapidograph. Yeah. And so there's no variation in the width of the So line. you started with rapidograph. Yeah. And um, then you moved to the dip pen. Yes. And why did you do that? Um, I can't quite remember when I changed over, but I loved getting a richer, more varied line. Um, uh, I just thought it brought, made the made the characters look more alive. There's more like emotional resonance. If I could have just a heavier line that thinned out. Um, gosh, I wish I'd researched when I did that. I'm not. It doesn't matter. Doesn't what kind matter. of nib do you use? I use a Hunt number 100 artist nib, which is very finicky. I don't think I even am using it properly. I, I never really learned. I, I missed that day of school. So, it was only after I'd been using steel pens for like 10 years that someone said, you know, they have like mineral oil on them. You have to wash them first. <laughs> so that helped a lot. But and what still... kind of ink do you use? Or what did you use back here when you were doing Dykes to Watch Out For? Or has it changed? It, it's always changing. I, now I'm using uh, a bottled um, Sumi ink. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm having trouble with it because it, for some reason, bleeds onto my plate finished Bristol board in a bizarre way that I can't and I think they're making the Bristol differently now. I hate it Two when they change kinds. the ways they make products. Bristol. I know. I just, it used to be so, you could get such a... You know, you get a perfect tool, and then they change it. And it's so frustrating. They ruined rapidographs. I mean, I've, I've coped. Yeah. They, you know, I used to be able to do things with the rapidograph with no sweat, and now I have to watch out because it'll do some bizarre thing. And... Uh, these American versions of the Japanese uh, brush pens are not the same. This, the Japanese version, you know, I use, that's what I use for all of the uh, African-American hair in Stuck Over Baby. Uh, and it looks like real brush. Mm -hmm. the, the ones that you buy now at the uh, art store, all you get is a, it's, it's just. But do you know about jet pens? No. Oh, yeah, they're good. Tell me, tell me. It's, just, it's an amazing website that has all kinds of, Good Japanese pens on it. Oh, good. And there's all it. kinds of weird stuff I've I've never even known about. But wait, uh, can I, uh, I want to say something yeah. about pens because I'm talking about getting a varied line with my dip pen, but Howard is the master. Oh, we're going to get varied. to that. Okay, believe me, there's all a right. whole section on that. <laughs> um, when you were doing Dykes to Watch Out for, what were your corrections? Did you use whiteout or paste? Uh, in the early days, it was whiteout and, you know rubber cement pasting things in, and now that stuff is all brown and crumbling and looks terrible. And then at a certain point, I just started fixing it in Photoshop. And in something like this, were you using different nibs? Because you have a real thick line and a real thin line, or is that all one uh, nib? The panel and balloon outlines are with a brush, like a number one or two brush. And the text is with a, a rut ring mechanical pen, and then the drawings are with the dip pen. I hope you guys aren't bored with this. I love this shit, so put up with it.
Okay, now we're going to talk about Howard's inking. Howard uses a rapidograph, and he's left-handed. What is it? What do you do to ink left-handed? Well, if you're left-handed, you learn early in grammar school to hold your pen a special way so you don't drag your hand over the wet. You know, Can you demonstrate you just, uh, how you hold your... You know, it's sort of twisted over. It's and I've heard that there's a higher percentage of left-handed cartoon cartoonists than there are in the regular population. How many cartoonists are here? How many of you are left-handed? I don't know. Blew Is that, that scientific? Theory, <laughs> Um, so Howard does everything with a rapidograph, right? Yes. Now, uh, here's the no, scary part. Except for I couldn't do Wendell's hair with a rapidograph. That's a brush. So this thick and thin line, the leg here, which I've blown up here, <laughs> this is how Howard does it. He outlines it and fills it in. It's insane. With Photoshop. Uh, actually, back when the days, this was before Photoshop. No, yeah, well, it's just... So he Multiple outlines strokes. every pen stroke, and then when you fill it in, is it with rapidograph? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, if you've got a big black area, you can use a brush to fill it in. The thing about brushes is, and I so admire, I mean, when you talk about doing your panel boards with brushes, I just, I'm just amazed because a brush sees me and it says, time to split. And I mean, the hair is split. <laughs> uh, I, I do not understand people who can actually ink their important lines with brushes. Well, I don't think the panel outlines are important. That's why I can do it. I couldn't do the drawings with a brush because yeah. I need to have a pressure, a certain amount of pressure to draw. I just, they just always split uh, for me. And uh, I mean, like I said, I do use brushes for things like uh, Wendell's hair, which needs to have. We'll get to that. And for ve vegetation, <laughs> you know. No, but this kind of please. stippling is all, is this rapidograph? Yeah. So do you get carpal tunnel? I don't think it, it, isn't, it isn't repetitive in the same way mm -hmm. as things that cause... So you're changing. But what does happen is I, if I don't draw for a while, if I'm busy writing or doing other things, and then I draw, I find I have to get back in shape. My muscles don't work well anymore. So after you've inked, now we go into digital, but this is back before the computer, and I love that there's some Bendet. Yeah. So talk about your process pre-digital. What would you do at the end of the cartoon? Well, first, that is like some zipatone that I stuck down up there. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would draw the thing, and then I would take it to the copy shop, where I would hope to get a decent machine. So I uh, could... Was it a Velox or a, just a... I dimly remember that word. What is Velux? Where they would shoot more it. Like a photograph. A staff. Oh no no. Uh, oh actually no. I God I've just forgotten all this all this unnecessary information. I would get a stat made. Uh huh. And then I'd make photocopies for the fifty newspapers from the photo stat. And you would mail them all. And I would mail them all with stamps and labels. <laughs> Didn't you have a pretty young assistant to? Uh... Actually I did. <laughs> We all Got need that. that. <laughs> um, and then at what point in Dykes to Watch Out for did you start using computer? I'm thinking this was done digitally, the color. Yes. I love this cover. Thank you. Yeah, this was like 2000, this book came out, and that was about the time that I uh, started, um, I got a scanner, got a digital tablet. How was that transition for you? Well, thanks to Howard, it was not as bad as it might have been. He was so generous. You had already gotten into Photoshop before I did, and he gave me tutorials over the phone. He's amazing. And so then it speeded things up for you? Well, not necessarily, because there's so many rabbit holes you can go down in Photoshop, you know. Here's Howard. You did all of Wendell pre-digital. No, I didn't go digital until after Wendell. And you put in photographs. Was that like stats yeah, that you... Yeah, well, all of those images of characters in the building, Capitol, and all of that uh, were gotten from the New York City uh, Public Library picture collection. And I would go and take them to this wonderful place that every cartoonist in New York knew for a while called Metro Giant. They could do big photo stats. And they screened them for me. I told them, you know, and I, I got them all screened in a screen that was, would harmonize with each other. And then it was exacto knife time, and I, you know, put it together. But because it was pre-screened, it became line art. 
you know, line art is what we normally end up with. It's very simple. You know, everything is either pure black or pure white. You know, we're not, unless, I wanted to ask you about, the, it looked like you had done some wash in one of those early uh, things. It looked uh, washy to me, and I, I was oh. interested in that. You know, yeah. almost you're very early in your, uh, washes are very, you, you can get in a lot of trouble yeah. with washes in terms of being reproduced badly. But anyway, uh, by the time I got all of those photographs together and pre-screened and pasted down, then I could do that collage. But it became complicated when I did the Wendell book, the, the Complete Wendell. Actually, the Wendell, Complete Wendell had a predecessor uh, called uh, Wendell Altogether, but it's essentially the same book, different publishers, different title. And uh, I had essentially, by that time, I had gotten very disgruntled with the look of you know, the old screens. And I, as much as possible, I redid all my screens uh, in Photoshop, which does a perfect screen. Uh, and, uh, but those uh, photographs, you know, oh. those photographs were beyond reach. You know, those, are, there was yeah. no way to refine, go back and find the picture collection, find it all over again and recreate that. So I just went with what existed. So this was in gouache? This is pre-computer? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, the first thing, the thing on the left is uh, what I sent to the advocate, you know, to tell them what I proposed to do. And uh, they asked me to do a cover. This was when Wendell had been absent from the advocate for a year and a half, and then we agreed to bring it back. And so that was the Wendell is back issue. And, uh, and since the computer, have you done gouache? Uh, no. Uh, it's messy. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can make an uncorrectable lost. mistake very easily. Yeah. Once I discovered the undo key in Photoshop, <laughs> you know, that was... <laughs> So uh, then your books, Allison, became, or your comics became collected in books, and I wonder how that changed. I mean, it was a different reading experience. People weren't reading it every two weeks in a paper. They were sitting down reading the whole book, yeah. and you also added extra stuff. Yeah. I felt bad because people were going to buy books of stuff they'd already read, so I wanted to give them something extra, so I started writing these little extended comic strips or novellas at the end of each of my Which also gave you breathing air space to yeah. make longer stories. Yeah. Yeah, I could really develop the characters, play with timing, do stuff that I could never do in the regular strip. And did you get a different kind of reader with your books? I don't... Uh, I felt like the same... I had the same audience, but people would often say that the the cartoons read differently, that they read like a novel when they were reading them in the book, which I always liked to hear. And then you started doing kinds of <laughs> schlock, which you could in your, um, your catalogs. So how did that happen? And was well, it I, Actually, this is how I got started. I, I made postcards of my early comics and hand-pedaled them to gay and lesbian and women's bookstores around Manhattan. Uh, and it grew into like all this crap, like T-shirts and mouse pads, and uh, and did you make money on it? Magnets. Don't yeah, magnets. Refrigerator magnets. Don't forget refrigerator magnets. I've got I those. Some. I made enough money to not have to have another job. So and you had the comely assistant, yeah, doing a lot of that. I had somebody help me like mail out the orders and stuff. But I was like taking credit card numbers and my, you know, at, at eleven o'clock at night. It was it was. It uh, became a business. Was it, it was. fun or was it a pain? It was sort of fun. It was sort of like playing store for a long time, and, but then it became like really too much. And you did calendars, and the calendars were kind of their own thing with their own comics. And one of the things you would do in the calendars is have the backstory of all her characters, but what they were like. Oh, yeah, like these are, like my characters all be, are all being played by actors who are very different from the characters we're accustomed to reading about. And, and Lois, just, Lois is just appalled that she has to have so much sex. <laughs> yeah. So you do a lot, in, especially in the calendars, you did a lot of sort of meta stuff with your strip. Well, I had to because the calendars, I couldn't do topical or political stuff because I had to do the calendars like way ahead of time, which I was not used to doing. So like over a year in advance. So that took out, you know, removed a lot of possibilities. So it left me with some self-referential stuff like this. But I always had fun with that. And when Wendell became, it be in different formats, the comics and the collected books, did you um, feel like it was a different way to read the comics? Well, there, 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 there were differences. I mean, some, and for the most part, you know, each spread was a strip, an episode. Um, 
Later, as I began to introduce more continuity in the strip, uh, I think it was a somewhat different experience. But there's one, you know, one thing I ran into the first time I did a book collection. Um, when you do a strip every two weeks, you know, you're always in the present, and you know. Mm -hmm. And but I had an episode in Wendell where Wendell's uh, first lover um, Sawyer came with his current lover uh, to visit Wendell. And, um, you know, at the time that I put it in the advocate, it was um, winter time. But I also had other little threads running through, and so I would come back to the, that, that, that. That visit essentially lasted about six months. <laughs> uh, and uh, before I finally got Sawyer and Ramon out of town. And um, when I put it in the book, you know, it was really weird. And I had to go back and redraw wow, sort of that. snow, little <laughs> bits of remaining snow in the springtime scene, you know, the to make early it vaguely possible that this could have been the same visit. And you also did uh, promotional stuff and products. How was that for you? Oh, it's uh, it was fun. I always wanted T-shirts and cup mugs and other stuff with my drawings on them. And it suddenly became practical because of the Cafe Press print on demand thing, uh, it's totally no way to make money unless you are willing to devote yourself to it obsessively. Uh, so basically it just sits there and anybody who wants the Wendell mug can go to Cafe Press and get it, but don't expect to have much company that month because um, they don't really sell. And this is the last Dykes to Watch Out For strip. Did you know when you drew it that it was gonna be the last one? I didn't, I knew I was I was going to take a break. Uh, I thought I was just going to take a little sabbatical as my, one of my characters is about to take a sabbatical in this episode. Um, but then I just slowly realized, no, no, I was really done. Do you want to go back to it ever? No. <laughs> I, I, I loved doing it so much, uh, but it was really, you know, it was very hard keeping up with those deadlines and it was a great relief to be done with it. And, uh, I just feel like it's it's done. I feel bad that I didn't resolve it, didn't have a proper ending. It's kind of like The Sopranos. It just <laughs> <laughs> went to black. Um, have you been, I know you've been approached about doing a film. Are you interested in ever seeing this filmed, Dykes to Watch Out For? There was some interest recently in, in like a, an animated, like sort of updating it, making the characters younger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But doing it as a series, and um, I, I've been interested in that over the years. Uh, in the old days, I felt like I couldn't let go of control. I would want to be very involved in any kind of animation project, so that never happened. Now I feel like I could let go, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like it's kind of done. And this is the last Wendell strip, and Howard, you knew it was the end, and you have this wonderful ending where you come in and speak to the viewer. Um, do you think you'd ever go back to do Wendell? The closest to that was recently the last, the complete Wendell, a collection the editor asked if I would do a Where Are They Now spread. So there's a spread imagining the Wendell characters in, you know, since the days of the strip. Um, but, uh, I don't see how it would how it would work. It's you'd have to age the characters. I mean, they were very much of the '80s, and if you really try to seriously bring them into the present day, they would all be, you know, approaching my age. Uh, and I don't think it would feel like Wendell anymore. Hmm. Um, and so I no, I don't. I think uh, Wendell was it's like Barefoots. I mean, people say do more Barefoots, but no, I thought my head was in a specific place when I was doing Barefoots, and the same is true of Wendell, and it's like probably the same is true of Stuck of Her Baby. Um, Speaking of which, so now it's 1995, and you did this amazing novel, comics novel, graphic novel. <laughs> um, why did you want to write this story? Well, I think any cartoonist who does, car does comics for a while wonders what would they do if they could do a graphic novel. It's just a natural curiosity factor. And I had, after I was ended Wendell, which I sort of had to do for financial reasons, the, what the 
advocate would pay would not keep up with. Oh, I wanted to ask you, did they, were you not allowed to run it anywhere else at the time? Like they had exclusive rights? Yeah, I mean, the whole point, they were paying me, it was pretty hard to get a magazine to pay you uh, decently uh, for a comic strip, and they would do that because they had it exclusively, at least first publication. There are a few, but I owned the copyright, and later a few magazines picked up some of them, you know, they ran here and there, but uh, it was only regular um, in the advocate. But I, um, after I quit Wendell, it was a period of what do I do with myself now? And uh, I, uh, my friend Martha Thomas, is, uh, at, who is the publicist at DC Comics at the time, she said, well, look, they have this new branch of DC called Piranha Press. They want to do experimental things. And why don't you contact that editor? And I, I did, and to, you know, Surprise! He was interested in the concept of a Howard Cruz graphic novel. So then he said, "So what would you, you know, what would you do if you did a graphic novel?" And all of a sudden, I thought about all these idle um, <coughs> thoughts I had had. And I thought about the unique experience in my life was accident, being an accidental father back when I was in college. And I thought, because you know, at that time there was a big, there were a lot of gay novels coming out. And it was all, everything was very Christopher Street, Castro Street, oriented. And, uh, but I thought nobody at that time was seeing anything about the experience of being in the closet and getting a girl pregnant, but which is what happened to me. And, you know, it sounds kind of, it's not fair to the girl to say get a girl pregnant. You know, this was a relationship. Uh, it was really a lovely relationship. Uh, but we, we're not destined to be husband and wife. Um, so the baby was given up for adoption. And it seemed like there was a lot of emotional possibilities in that. And then I thought, but this is a little bit thin soup for a full novel. So then I thought, but when that was happening was when I was in Birmingham during the civil rights era. And uh, one of the ways this girl was important to me, uh, aside from having that relationship, was that she essentially raised my consciousness about political activism. And that, uh, you know, that, that sort of started the wheels turning. And that's where the basis of my proposal to DC Comics. And then uh, after they okayed it and I started actually trying to do a draft, I realized a million ways that you know, had a synopsis and it wouldn't work and it wasn't good enough and it was, had cliches in it. And so by the time I turned in the working script for the book, about, you know, 90% of it did not appear in the synopsis of my, uh, I had given them, and about 90% of the synopsis was not in the book. Uh, but a few things, the core themes were. So that first script had no art, it was just, pro it was I writing. Sent a, I sent in a proposal, I gave them a proposal, and it had some illustrations of characters, uh, none of which wound up looking like the way the characters find. Look, they look too much like Wendell characters. And then in 2006, Fun Home came out. Um, you were thinking about this story for a long time. I was. Um, I mean, all your life, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, I started writing Fun Home in 1999 with great trepidation because I had seen Howard go through five years of intense, dedicated labor on Stuck Rubber Baby. You were like just chained to your drawing board. Um, and I knew how much work it could be. So it was, it was very daunting. Um, but my um, publisher at Firebrand Books said to me sometime in the mid-90s, look, everyone's doing graphic novels. This is a hot new thing. You should do a graphic novel. So I thought, okay, what will I do a graphic novel about? And I had this intense personal story about my dad that I had always wanted to tell, and it became pretty clear that I was going to do it in a graphic novel, graphic memoir. And, I mean... You're so obsessed with nailing everything down. I wondered how in the writing process did you ever just let go of anything and say, well, this isn't the exact shoe, but that's okay. Like, how did you balance truth and fiction? I, I tried not to let go. And, and interestingly, as I, over the course of my work on Fun Home from like 1999 to 2006, that's when I was getting all digital. And that's when one day I learned about Google image search. <laughs> so unlike Howard, who had to go to the freaking picture file to find all those like Birmingham parking meters and stuff, <laughs> um, I could 
readily find references for all the stuff I needed to draw. And over the course of this project, my drawing got a lot more specific, and I realized I could draw the actual thing. I didn't have to make it up or draw it out of my head. So you must be a pack rat. I mean, you must, you must, you seem to have lots of photographic reference and old diary entries and all that stuff. I do. I, I, I'm a bit of a hoarder. But it's very well organized. Is this, a, is this something you actually did before you wrote? Or yeah, something? this is like one of many, many like organizational projects, like the little charts that I made for myself. I forgot about this. I, I just ran across it when I was digging fu images up for you. Uh, I don't even remember it, but yeah, it was like I was trying to organize the book in my head. And did you sit down and write a full script without any pictures? No, no, no. My process was... Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, I started writing words early on, writing down memories that I knew this would, would be a key part of the book. And then I, I began this practice of writing in Adobe Illustrator while I was trying to write Fun Home because I couldn't compose it with just words. I needed to have the page. I wasn't actually drawing in Illustrator because I can't draw with that crazy tool, but I would map my panels out and um, you know, my text boxes and dialogue, and I'd, I'd write like that. But that evolved as I was writing the book. We'll get to that. Um, Howard, you have a whole different style of drawing for Stuck Rubber Baby, different than bar Barefoot's and different than Wendell. Yes. When I started out, I mean, this, is, this was so foolish of me to think this would work, but I was so daunted by the idea of doing a 200-page book I thought, well, I will just adopt a sketchier style. It'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it fast. <laughs> I'll, I will set myself up. I would demand a certain number of pages, a certain amount of time I did the arithmetic on how much would I have to do. And I just, and I just did not appreciate the fact that um, it takes a lot of time to do a good sketch, too. Um, I mean, because it's still got to compose, compose the panels. There's a, a lot of decisions you have to make. Well, and your pages are so complex, and you had the full bleeds, and I, yeah, it's just breathtaking. And you'll notice on this one that one of the virtues of going through these different stages that I described was that you do have the opportunity to make changes along the way. Like, I thought I was going to have Toland's lover to his left in this big page, and it was just one thing too many, you know, so he went away. Uh, by the time I entered. This was, and I was experimenting with how am I going to do this, and one way I was thinking about doing it was sort of doing it in a sketchy way, using typewriter type, you know, for the balloons, and just try to to get the whole book in mind that way, and I only did that a little while, and I realized this is, I'm, I'm talking about drawing a whole book twice, yeah. and so I abandoned that system. And at this point, you had computer technology? No. No, this was all so pre-digital. Pre-digital. All pre-digital. Pre so this was a lot of trips to the copy shop in Manhattan to get things sized different ways so I could trace them. This is, I gave you this because this was an example. You know, when I was teaching cartooning to friends, I would say, don't do what I just did here. Um, I was so confident I knew what the composition of this panel was going to be that I put placed that narration block uh, before I penciled and inked it. And then I realized, oh, this is not going to work because everything's crowded into the sort of L shape. And then I've got this big empty area uh, to the upper right. And that's really bad composition. And this is a case where I realized early enough, OK, start over. And so this is the way it appears in the book. But because I started over, it gives you a chance to look at what my pencils on Bristol board look like, because this was one I never got to the point of inking. So it's kind of tight, but not totally tight. It still allows room for uh, final adjustments. And uh, as Eddie will tell you, for any number of times, he, he and I both worked at home at the time, he in one end of the apartment and I in the other. And there would me be calling to him and his side of the apartment, Eddie, come be, mo be a model. Because it's, it's a lot easier to sort of think, OK, I'll draw somebody with their coat over their head that it is, think about exactly how the folds would work, how will that happen. So I needed him to come and, and model. So I Did Eddie ever, ever get tired of that? Hmm? Did Eddie ever get tired it's of good. that? I didn't do it all that much. <laughs> yes. It wasn't like you photographing me, myself, in every position for every drawing. Is that... <laughs> um, 
he was very gracious about it, but, uh, you know, it was very helpful. This is another sequence you changed. You have this, yeah. and then right. it had to be... I, um, in this case, it was an example. I had a complex uh, composition that was just too complex. Uh, you know, reading, you know, following the narration, narration balloons from one to one in that way, it was just snaked around in an awkward way. And uh, it's always hazardous when you have interlocking panels that the reader will read them in the wrong order. And so, uh, so over here is the way that same section appears in the book, where it's a little saner, you know. It's still a bit of a montage, but. So now we're going to do your process. Oh, it's so distressing seeing my crappy drawings up there after looking at Howard's. I to, can I just tell a quick story about, at some point I got asked to do a collaboration with Howard. Like it was, oh, we're going to get to that. Oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, hold, I'll hold my story. <laughs> um, so this is Allison's process. You start with the text in the layout. Yeah, this is what I wrote in Illustrator, and then print it out, and then I start just sketching. So at this point, you have already had your uh, phony uh, uh, hand lettering uh, yes. font? Yes, yes. Okay, because that looks hand lettered. No, that's the phony font. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and does this text ever change? Like, do you go back and oh, yeah. rewrite? So this yeah. is just sample text. Yeah, They're kind this of is just first draft. Yeah. And then here you are. This is just a like a second generation sketch with tr on tracing paper on top of that last version and another one. <coughs> and these are all the images I found online to help me, or or poses that I took of myself to um, that I used in that drawing. And you you you're sort of well known for posing for every character. And at the beginning you were doing Polaroids, and then it switched. Well, I didn't I didn't do it for every character until there was digital photography, and you could do it for free. Because those Polaroids are expensive. I was going to say it, it must have. You must have a stack. I do have a huge morgue of them, but I would only I would only use those when I really had something tricky. Otherwise, I would try and figure it out in my head. But now I don't have to. And now that you do it digitally, do you delete those pictures or keep them? Oh, I keep them. I knew my you would. <laughs> I knew you would. Completely bogged down with them. Do you ever go back and use other poses, like the old poses? No, because it's much easier to just make a new one than try to find an old one. Go back. We're here, and then here. Yeah, these are just successive. And each one of these are done on a light box. No, over? just looking, just tracing paper, looking at the last sketch. So they get, and that's the that's the pencil on the light box. And here's a whole bunch of Howard's references. Yeah, boy, drawing a stairwell. Man. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I knew this was coming up. It was very important that the characters live a number of floors up so that the sort of magical quality of the ending where Wendell steps out the door of the apartment and he's on ground level in his life many years ago. So I, that was important. And uh, so I, I just, everywhere Betty, Eddie and I would visit, I'd say, oh, where's the stairwell in your building? I've got to find one that will do. But the perspective works in a stairwell is really confusing. Uh, I wanted a really sexually magnetic Les Pepper. And you got him. I got him. This is from a porn magazine. <laughs> uh, Eddie! Eddie, once again, the, he had a guitar in the I house. I love this picture, Eddie. <laughs> yeah, you know, I went out, I needed, I, I was... I was nervous about how babies are handled, and so I said, so I went around our neighborhood in Jackson Heights. I went to buy one of those baby dolls, you know, like anybody had, <laughs> and I couldn't find it. It was all Barbies, um, and then I finally found this dino. This was the dinosaur uh, TV that? show. Uh, no, I think I don't think it survived our many moves. But I got Eddie to pretend that was a baby, and I photographed him holding it in different positions for that. <laughs> And then, you know, a lot of the, the styles people wore, uh, I got from a Sears and Roebuck catalog at the uh, uh, Fashion Institute of Technology. I was at the picture collection in the library. They've got loads of pictures, but they're all models of stylish people <coughs> clipped from magazines. I wondered what everyday people would wear in the early 60s or late 50s. And so uh, somebody said, oh, go over, look at the old Sears catalogs. And that's what I did. I got a bunch of reference uh, from that. 
and I went around Birmingham looking for interesting houses because I have just no sense of architecture. And left to my own devices, I would draw every house like we did in the first grade. Um, uh, so I really needed to see some real houses. Also finding interiors of cars. I could find lots of pictures of the outsides of cars, clipped from old car ads, but I needed insides of cars. And cars. I looked out, looked out, a friend of mine knew the guy who was the head of the uh, Brooklyn Classic Car Organization or something, it's like that. He, he provides cars for period movies. He's had loads of cars from, really from the 50s, but the characters in my book would be you know, they were in the 60s, but they would not have new cars. Right. So I wanted 50s cars. And so he spent a Saturday, no charge, taking me around Brooklyn to these different garages and letting me climb inside the cars and photograph the dashboards and things like that. And uh, Harvey Picar pointed me to this old record store this, uh, so that I could find a, uh, you know, a, a believable old, uh, you know, 78 RPM sleeve. Uh, and this is just old uh, racist publications from uh, that you know I found uh, in my mother's basement. Not because she was a racist, but because uh, she was a pack rat. And these things would come into our house uh, because, you know, for various reasons, they were floating around and they were artifacts. They were obvious artifacts. So I had that. And now we move to. So now we're back to Allison. Um, you had a ton of family stuff that you could read. That you could go to, and also all your lettering in Fun Home is hand done. Here's your dad's letter, and you reproduced it? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, my, the text of the book is done in the font, but there's still a whole lot of this weird hand lettering in books and letters and quotations that I used. And it's so beautiful that you did it, and it's so crazy. <laughs> I want to go back. How old is your dad here? Um, probably 40. It was not unhot. <laughs> we always call this. Howard's gonna. <laughs> we call this his shit. <laughs> and you reproduce tunes in Fun Home, and you did this drawing of the Charles Adams. Yeah, I wanted to qu quote this Charles Adams cartoon in my story, but I knew I couldn't just copy. I couldn't just like, you know, paste his comic. It felt like. Why, that, why couldn't you? Well, because you can't just steal people's work, can you? <laughs> People do it. I don't know. I mean, I know why you, why, yeah, it's interesting that you think that way because lots of people don't. It's risky. It's risky. But, but what I figure I, maybe it's okay if I redraw it myself. I still don't know if that's legal. No one has uh, sued me yet. But. but what I love is that you redrew the whole damn thing even though you were just cropping a little section. Well, yeah, it's I wanted fair to, use. It's fair use. I, that's what I, I'm hoping. Yeah. But I wanted to, you know, experience what it was like for him to work. It was, it's such a great project to, you know, copy someone else's work that you admire just to see what, how they do it. It's, it's beautiful. I think you should do more. Right. I mean, of your own original Charles Adams person. <laughs> <laughs> then you might get see. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we gotta move, because this is, uh, inking, Howard's inking in Stuck Rubber Baby. Um, at this point, what, you're still using rapidograph? Yeah, now you'll notice the hair is brush. Hair doesn't have to be tight, and the water spray was brush. Um, but anytime I need careful control, it's rapidograph. What do you listen to while you're inking? Um, well, when I was doing stuff about ginger and civil rights stuff, I listened to old Weaver's albums. Oh, you, you coordinate your listening to the thing you're trying? To, to get me in the mood. And uh, when I was doing uh, songs by Anna Deline, I listened to uh, Billy Holiday records. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, just to get me in the mood. And here's something you redrew. Now, when you're doing a book length piece, by the time you're done with the. Told them look different. You, your style, yeah. So you went back and drew, redrew sections. Yeah, this was the way I drew it. I drew the first page first, and that was how he looked, but he looks very Cro Magnon ish. Uh, he's a. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd gotten to know the character. You have to draw a character a bunch of times before you really get to know them. And once you do, you realize, oh, this is wrong. So I, had to, I didn't go back and, you know, draw everything over, but I took the most egregious examples of someone not looking how they looked by the end of the book and uh, pasted over new drawings on them. 
This there is was a an, beautiful. Oh, if there was an award for like the least white space in comics, you would win it. <laughs> it's incredible. Every surface is crosshatched. But it's very hazardous. You know, you, my cartooning students, um, once they discover crosshatching, it turns into a big blur of lines. You know, the oh, important, I had part enough... is, important part is the negative space too. You know. Yeah. No. Um, it's definitely you have critical areas of white, but not a lot. Howard, did you ink from the beginning to the end in order? No, but I did a complete chapter at a time because that, that was less scary. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but previous to that, I had done underground comic stories that would tend to be four, five, six, seven, eight pages. And uh, that I, you know, thinking about, oh, now I'm going to draw 200 pages just terrified me. And so, so I would do each chapter as if it was an underground comic story, but I don't draw in order. I draw a little bit on this page, a little bit on this page. That's why I had to tell DC when they were talking about using me, I said, one thing you have to get used to, I cannot work your way. I cannot submit pencils for somebody to look at. You know, there is no point where a whole page is pencils. It's a whole page done to ink here, the rest of it's blank. Allison, do you do your books in order? <coughs> the inking? Uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah. This spread is just an, one example of your incredible layouts. Um, I don't know, I just want to look at it. <laughs> well, this was when, when Sammy is talking to his paralyzed father, who essentially cannot move and has to listen. And this was very important to me because, in a way, it was one of the core moments. It was the way I felt about America. I felt because the, you just wanted America to be still and listen to what you're doing to us gay people, you know? And uh, so that was the sort of emotion behind that. This is Allison's, the rest of your process. So we left off with your pencils. Here you are inking, and you're using the brush for the thick lines and a Yeah, and then the nib. dip pen for the drawing. And then I cheated by just scanning it into Photoshop and doing all the blacks in Photoshop. So all your solid blacks are Photoshop. Yeah, all my originals look like shit. The They're just, like yeah, they look like that. <laughs> That's something, it's weird how now with digital, our originals... Don't yeah, look the it's, same. it's yeah. And what are you using for your wash? The same ink? Yeah, yes. Well, it's. It, I think I actually used it. I think this is actually rapidograph ink, watered down, not the sumi ink. Uh, have a couple different strengths of that, and I put my line art on the light box and put watercolor paper on top. And so look, see yeah. the what the areas I had to shade, and then I would just do it quickly. I, because I knew from watching Howard go through this that I was, there was no way I was going to crosshatch a 200-page <laughs> book. <laughs> so I had, I had to find a quicker way, and it was this brush. Um, what kind of brush do you use? Oh, just a, I don't know, like a <coughs> whatever brush. Whatever. <laughs> and so you're, you're, you scan in your wash, and the, these are in layers on Photoshop? Yes. Yeah, exactly. But you had to make peace with the fact that you couldn't control it. You couldn't get everything within the lines, you know. I mean, you, you talk about liking to be in control, but you have to loosen up. For yeah, this. I did, but I liked that. I liked the little I kind it. of off register I love it. I think it's a beautiful quality. Um, and then this is done. Your, your lettering is in Illustrator, and are those Illustrator files you bring into Photoshop? I placed the Photoshop files in Illustrator, I think. Oh, I so did. your final file is in Illustrator? Yes. And you do your color in Illustrator. Yeah, yeah, then you can just, because oh. you can't do that. I have not found a way to do that in Photoshop, because it's, See, a, I would, yeah, it's it, a tone, it you know. You can do it in Photoshop, but it, it works either way. Oh, now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, here's a spread that is a little different from the rest of the book. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, I mean, I did very little with page layout in my book. It's very standard, just a regular, uh, I think, like, six-panel grid. Unlike Howard with his many bleeds and the, all those incredible shapes and innovative layouts, I, I was all I could do to get the panels on the page, let alone, you know, do, do something creative with them. So, but there's only two cases in, in Fun Home where I use the spread in some way, and one is this spread 
where it's different, it's, there's many more panels than the regular grid, and it's this pivotal conversation I'm having with my dad in the car, so I wanted it to look really different. And Howard, what was the response to Stuck Rubber Baby? It was a, I mean, you're talking about civil rights, you're talking about gay rights, you're talking about a lot of complicated issues. How did people take to a comic book? Well, form? I mean, it's, it's been very gratifying. Most people have gotten what I wanted them to get. You know, I've had very few quibbles. Sooner or later, I'm going to run into somebody who hates it enough to embarrass me in public, but so far, it hasn't really happened. And it's been translated into many languages, right? You're about many, not like some people 20 and 30, but no, this is, I think it's been in uh, five, five languages other than English. And do you have any, would you ever do anything else with this story, like if someone wanted to film it or do anything? Um, that, that, I mean, if someone, I mean, occasionally there's been interest, you know, in a film version or a TV miniseries or something like that. The problem is I don't own the rights. Uh, DC Comics owns the rights, and so far they haven't been in the mood to uh, Could encourage. they do something without your permission? Uh, probably. Um, they could de-gay it. Um, <laughs> That's scary. I, I would not, I, it's in the contract. I, I had an amazing, you have to remember, when this thing started out, I had no clout economically. I'd never made much money for anybody, and they had to do me, even though it was not enough, it was still a huge advance uh, compared to anything else I'd ever gotten before. And uh, what I got was they agreed to this great deal of creative freedom. Um, but um, that's where it ends. They own the rights, the licensing rights, and everything. Now, if they license it for something, I get a cut. If they make money, I get a cut. But if they wanted to make a movie that was totally, you know, nothing about gay in it, um, technically I could whine, but. And Allison, the response to Fun Home was pretty overwhelming. Um, how strange was that? Uh, it's been very strange, and it seems to get stranger with each passing week. Um, <laughs> here we go, yes. Um, well, I'm not going to go into the musical too much because we'll talk about that on Saturday, but um, it must be kind of like the Plato's allegory where there's you and your family in reality, you and your family in your memory, you and your family in the comic, and you and your family in the musical. Yeah, and me in the audience watching all of that. <laughs> yeah, it's really mind-boggling. And here's your jam. Um, this was one of the greatest comics lessons I ever had, because at first, my drawings, I mean, I, I saw how, how weak my drawings looked next to Howard's. Like, he has these amazing outlines and varied textures. His images are just so, just, they just pop out. They're like almost three-dimensional. Um, and so I, after working on this with him, I, I, I really had to up my game. I, I worked a lot harder on making my drawings look better. I didn't really know what I was doing before. This was a, it was a good lesson. Howard, um, the writing, the penciling, the inking, do you have a favorite? Well, the inking is more fun because the serious, most serious anxiety provoking part of it is done. Mm -hmm. you, you know where you're going. Uh, so in that sense, that's, uh, yeah, I guess that, that's the favorite. Uh, the writing is murder. I, I go crazy with the writing. How about it. you, Allison? Same. <laughs> yeah, the writing is, is excruciating, and the drawing is difficult, but it's a different kind of difficult. It's like a, sort of a known quantity. I just have to do the work. A lot of it depends on how rushed I am. When I'm relaxed, I can enjoy the whole process of drawing much more, but if I have a deadline bearing down on me, um, it, it really is... Um, There's nothing upset. worse than having to crank out a lot of pages and just not being able to take any pleasure in it. It's a, it's a horrible task. So my last question to both of you is, how, I'll start with Howard. How has all these years of cartooning changed you as a person? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> well, it, it turned me from a 16-year-old uh, person to a 72-year-old person. Well done, well done. <laughs> and Allison, same question. Oh, God. Uh, I. I've, I've had the just most bizarre good fortune in this field. Uh, I, it's, it's amazing to me that I've gotten to keep 
doing it. It really wasn't that clear in like the early 2000s <coughs> that I was going to be able to keep making a living off of Dykes to Watch Out For. And, and I had a lot hinging on Fun Home, and I it, it paid off. It, it worked. I was really lucky. Um, and now I get to keep doing comics, so... And don't forget to mention her other book, Are You My Mother? Well, there's, both of you have so many other <laughs> books. We didn't have time to do everything. I want to thank you guys for this. And we have two microphones here, and we have some time. So if anybody wants to ask questions, run up to the microphone. Um, or are you all overwhelmed with cartooning Jen, trivia? Thank you for compiling all these questions on the slides and everything. Oh, I love talking about this shit. This is what I do all day. <laughs> I hope you guys aren't bored with this. This is, to me, what I think about a lot. So, um, yes. Uh, this is a question for Allison. Um, one of the things that I loved about Dykes to watch out for when I was sort of first discovering your comic was the dialogue and the interactions between the, the characters was so vivid and their, their personalities were very, very distinct. And reading your more recent work, the, 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 there's no dialogue in it. It's like a very interior, almost an essay kind of mode where the images are there, but the words are, they're connected, but they're connected in a very sort of different way. And I was just wondering which, which mode you feel more comfortable in, the, the essay mode or the dialogue mode. I do really love the essay mode, and I like that you said that you called it an essay because I do feel like Fun Home, even though it is a, a memoir, it, in many ways, it's structured like an essay. It's not really a dramatic narrative. It's it's a it's chapters about ideas that I'm exploring. But I yeah I I like that. I am always trying to find ways to make those ideas more engaging and accessible to a reader. That's the trick. Next question. Question for Howard. Um, this may be more about me than about you, but a lot of your drawings make me think of R. Crumb, and I wonder to what extent, if any, you felt that he was uh, an influence or an inspiration. Well, the, the, the cross hatching is the thing that immediately makes think, people think of, of Crumb because we both use a lot of it. Um, I. Uh, in some ways, he, I mean, he was definitely an influence just because he opened up the feeling that you could do anything in comics and uh, that, that you could be smart in comics. I mean, his, you know, his, his comics are very smart for all of their crudity. Um, but I also spent years keeping away from cross-hatching because I was afraid of comparison. I just felt like he's a master. There's some other masters. Uh, Jack Davis is another master and there are several others that I'm in awe of. And I was afraid of comparison. And finally, I said, you know, you just got to get over it. Just jump in, jump in the water. So I did. Any more questions? Do you guys have anything you want to ask each other? <laughs> we have these conversations anytime we get together. And I can't remember what they consist of. But we always have questions to ask each other. I think we've already asked them. Yeah. We really could. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all your intimate thoughts with us. I was wondering about uh, more uh, more strips, like more, you know, like either weekly or monthly. Or uh, I'm wondering um, what kind of uh, you know queer comic strips uh, did you enjoy? Were you perhaps you know wanting to Make yours stand out or better better than uh, stuff you already saw. I'm just wondering if there were other comic strips that inspired you. Well, I, I mean, I was totally inspired by Wendell, um, not just by the amazing stories and the beautiful art, but by the fact that Howard was this really amazing cartoonist who could have been in the mainstream and had made this decision to write gay material. That was really inspiring to me, and um, it made me want to do that same thing. And it enabled me to write about my own queer life in Dykes Watch Out For and then later in this memoir stuff, but also um, I wanted it to be really good. I, worked, I wanted it to be as good as it could be. And often you didn't really have to be that good because people were so desperate to see their lives reflected, you could get away with not doing 
super good work, but I, I it, Howard made me want to keep raising the bar. I was very inspired by uh, Mary Wings, Roberta Gregory, and Lee Mars. Um, and uh, in each of those cases, in different ways, um, they showed how human comics could be. I mean, the, both obviously, Mary Wings, uh, in particular, uh, her come out comics in Dyke Shorts, you know, said, oh, okay, you know, we can do this. And uh, Dynamite Damsels, I saw um, shortly after that, or I forget which order, but anyway, uh, I felt there was a humane quality that was an interesting contrast to the preponderance of the male underground cartoonists um, who would like to do shock and stuff and did it very effectively. Um, but I really liked the fact that uh, the women's comics, and not just the uh, gay women, but the women's comics in general seemed interested in aspects of life that were more subtle and I responded to that. It just made it more interesting. It was less repetitive uh, to read their comics. And I wanted, of course, I had an easy time of it because there was so much un, unexplored territory uh, when I started out. You know, that nobody had done much in the way of the kind of gay comics I wanted, I, I thought would be interesting. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for sharing with us. My question is, do you have anything to offer those of us who are just starting out in cartooning, like um, places to start, things to think about, sage advice, whatever? <laughs> I, I want to say one thing. Going through all their work, I mean, I've read probably everything you guys have done. And, but putting it all together and looking at it, these two work so fucking hard. I mean... The amount of work you have turned out, the amount of numbers of pen strokes, you know, it's kind of frightening. And I think one thing that people forget about is it's hard work. I mean, I always remember, Allison, that comic, you I can't go to this thing. I got work to do. The, the uh, Michigan Women's Festival, these <laughs> slackers, and she's in her tent finishing her cartoon because she's on deadline. I mean... You, I think one of the big things to, tell, to, to keep in mind as any kind of artist is you got to keep doing it and do a lot of it. Yeah, I, I feel like that's the only real advice I would give because every, everything is different now. The whole, everything, the, the way that you find comics, the way that you make comics is so different now. I have no practical advice on that. I think you, you really have to decide how important is it to me to, me to be excellent as opposed to simply get something out there. Uh, and it will make a difference in how much money you make. Uh, you can make more money by not being excellent. Um, but it's so much more satisfying to look back, even, even though you always say, oh, I, this could have been so much better. But nonetheless, you know you were trying as hard as you could then, and it, uh, you can take pride in the fact that you were really trying to make those strides. Uh, beyond that, you know, it's web comics and win the lottery or get a spouse who will support you or something, you know, because it's, uh, it's very tough to make a living. But uh, as far as doing the work, you know, it just, it's just about settling down and saying, how good can this be? And trying. Hi, this question is for Allison. Um, at home, in the chapter where you talk about the um, canary-colored caravan of death, you describe this moment where your father colors over the drawing that you were coloring on, and you said um, that you sort of swore off color for a while. So how did you decide upon the wash color for Fun Home? I, I actually didn't want to use color in Fun Home at all. That wash was just going to be gray like it was when I put it down myself. But as we were doing production on the book, um, the people at the publisher said, well, you know, we could make this gray a color. You could pick any color you wanted. And I, I wanted it to be gray because I, it was a statement to my father, like, you know, fuck you, I don't need color. I'm going to tell this very nuanced story, and it's going to be in all black and white. But then I realized, when I saw how good it could look, I thought, well, I'm not going to let my father, like, control, <laughs> continue to control my life. So I said, OK, let's do the color. That's how that happened. Why did you pick that turquoise? I 
I just looked for a color that was sad, and that was the color I, I picked. <laughs> That's all it was. Well, thank you all. I hope this was fun for you guys and not too um, technical, but I figure you're all cartoonists. Um, thank you, Howard and Allison. This was really <laughs>I think there's still one ticket to Fun Home available for $75. Saturday night we're going as a group, a cartoonist group, and Allison's going to be there doing a Q&A afterwards. And the ticket is available at the book room. Talk to Ted Abenheim if anybody's interested. Thank you all for coming.